A very good afternoon to one and all who are connected. I'm happy to welcome you all to the 93rd Continuous Medical Education event organized by the CME Committee, Faculty of Medicine, Bioscience and Nursing, Massa University. Today's speaker is Madam Sharon. Psych she's a psychologist and head of the unit of psychiatry at Faculty of Medicine, Bioscience and Nursing, Massa University. She joined Massa in the year 2015 and she has been working in the Department of Psychiatry where she's involved in teaching uh, psychology uh, for MBBS clinical years for year four and year five. And she's currently the head of the unit of psychiatry. She previously worked for the UK National Health Service, where she was involved in training health professionals in the psychological principles of behavior, behavior change. She has also held various teaching posts in UK universities, teaching health psychology to both undergraduate and postgraduate students. In addition, she has vast experience of teaching psychology to medical and non-medical students at both undergraduate and postgraduate levels. She is currently the Chief Research Officer for the Tobacco Harm Reduction Research Project in Malaysia and is currently a reviewer for the Medical Education Journal, The Medical Teacher. And today she is going to deliver a talk on resilience and mental health. Without delay, I would like to request Madam Sharon to deliver her talk. Over to you, Madam Sharon. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Dr. Deepa, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, I really appreciate that. I would like to say a big thank you to everybody listening, uh, colleagues of the faculty and the wider academic community. Um, I'm very grateful that you are spending your time on Friday afternoon to listen to me. I really appreciate that. Okay, without much further ado, I'm going to be talking about resilience and mental health. So the overview of the session this afternoon is, first of all, I'm going to introduce, I'm going to give a brief introduction to positive psychology because I cannot talk about resilience without talking about positive psychology. Then I'm going to talk a bit about the role of positive psychology in our everyday lives. Then I'm going to move on to talk about the broaden and build theory from Professor Barbara Fredrickson. And then I'm going to talk about resilience I'm going to talk about that itself. I'm going to uh, say what it is and I'm going to talk about what it does. And then I'm going to end the discussion, uh, conclude by talking about resilience and medical students. And I will explain a bit more about that later on. OK, so uh, as I just said, before I begin, let's talk about positive psychology. Let's talk about what it is. Um, Madam uh, Sharon, Sharon, yes. sorry for the sorry interruption. For the... Mm -hmm. Can I just ask you to give a slideshow of your presentation? Oh, sorry. OK. Thank you so much. Very sorry. OK. From the beginning. OK. 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 Thank you, Dr. Deeper. Is that is that OK now? You can see? OK. Thank you. So, yeah. as I said, before um, I'm going to talk about resilience, I want to talk about positive psychology. So, uh, let's talk about that. I'm going to give a very uh, brief overview of this field in psychology, uh, which has acquired much interest uh, since around about the late 90s, early 2000. Uh, it's summarised by Professor Martin Seligman of Penn University, uh, actually, uh, Professor Martin Seligman is the father of positive psychology. And basically, the definition of it is that it is the science of optimal human functioning that aims to discover and promote the factors that allow individuals and communities to thrive. So uh, a bit more about it, it focuses on strengths. Notice that I've put the word in bold and I've underlined it. It focuses on strengths instead of the weaknesses, building the good in life instead of repairing the bad and taking the lives of average people up to great instead of focusing 
solely on moving those who are struggling up to normal. So basically what this means is that instead of focusing on the negative and the weaknesses in our lives, of which we all have, um, positive psychology aims to promote the idea that we should be looking at our strengths. Um, and as I go through, I will say something about that. But this uh, quote uh, from Martin Seligman uh, states that, you know, one of the most significant findings in psychology in the last 20 years is that individuals can begin to choose the way they think. But why? Why is it, why positive psychology and what does that statement mean? Well, actually, uh, in the Western world, but not just only the Western world, the worldwide, really, you know, there's this been this long um, uh, rationale. So really, we've outgrown this long uh, rationale for purely a disease model of psychopathology. Um, psychology has been focused um, in the past. Uh, as stated by Martin Seligman, you know, that we we tended to, although we've done a lot in psychology, in understanding human behaviour, particularly in the abnormal side of uh, behaviour, such as stress, uh, depression and so on. Uh, but um, we need to try and do something to understand or prevent these problems in the first place. So uh, psychology has a lot to, has a big role to play um, in order to help us to understand and learn about normal flourishing. And this is what positive psychology is. Again, why? Uh, well, historically, as I've just said, it's tended to psychology itself as a discipline has focused on negative aspects of human life and the treatment of psychological illnesses and its path uh, psychopathology. Uh, but um, actually, uh, what I'm talking about here is uh, that positive psychology uh, aims to act more as a preventative strategy. Of course, it doesn't solve everything to do with psychopathology. Um, you know, there's, is it, the depression exists, stressors exist, anxiety exists. Uh, but uh, in the field of positive psychology, the focus is on what we can do to try and prevent these kinds of problems. So Martin Seligman uh, came up with this PERMA model of well-being in 2011. Um, and basically what he's talking about here is positive emotions. Positive emotions are an essential part of our well-being. Um, happy people look back on the past with gladness, look into the future with hope, and they enjoy and cherish the present. When we go down to the E, we're talking about engagement. When we focus on doing the things we truly enjoy and care about, we can begin to engage completely with the present moment and enter the state of being known as flow. So what that means is, you know, um, real concentration um, and passion um, for what we do. Then if we talk about relationships, everyone needs someone. Um, and so we can enhance our well-being and share it with others by building strong relationships with the people around us. You know, it could be family, friends, co-workers, neighbours and so on. And then if we look for meaning in life, we are at our best when we dedicate time to something greater than ourselves. So for some people, this might be religion, it might be community work, it might be family, politics, a charity, a professional or a creative goal. And then when we go to the A part, we go to the green uh, square, we talk about accomplishment. Um, everyone needs to win sometimes. So we want to achieve well-being and happiness. We must be able to look back on our lives with a sense of accomplishment. So in other words, I did it and I did it well. Uh, whilst this might sound very kind of flowery, um, actually there is a lot of research in the field of positive psychology you know, which has um, had a, a good um, promotion of this idea in the field of mental health. And I'll say more about that a bit later. Uh, Barbara Fredrickson um, is a professor also working alongside Martin Seligman. And she came up with this broaden and build theory. 
So you can see there on the, the, the smiley face, um, she has studied the value of positive emotions and the positive affective experience which contribute to and have a long lasting effect on our personal growth and development. But how does it work? So like all theories, we need to understand a bit more about how does this actually work and what, what is it? Uh, well, positive emotions broaden our thought action repertoire. So in other words, um, positive emotions broaden our attention and thinking um, at a very basic level. You know, if we experience positive emotions like joy or interest, then of course that's going to broaden our repertoire. Um, and I can liken that to the reward and reinforcement principles, very basic learning principles in psychology. You know, you experience something pleasant, rewarded, and so that reinforces. And, you know, and we can do this. It's not simply um, that we can't do it. There are things that we can do to help us to do this. Um, and we are more likely to be creative and be more open-minded and flexible within this uh, broaden and build theory. Positive emotions undo negative emotions. So according to Barbara Fredrickson, it's difficult to experience both positive and negative emotions simultaneously. But what we can do is build the deliberate experience of positive emotions at a time when negative ones are dominant. So we can therefore undo lingering effects. So uh, what that means is, again, you know, the, the positives, if we look at it in layman's terms, the positives, positives outweigh the negatives if we allow it to do so, if we can train our minds to do that. Positive emotions enhance resilience. Now, I have put that in red because later on I'm going to be talking about resilience. Um, you know, and in the, the recent COVID pandemic, you know, we have heard, you know, mental health problems are on the increase, uh, suicides, um, you know, people have lost their jobs, people have, you know, lost uh, family members and so on. I'm not saying that the COVID-19 pandemic has only just seen, you, you know, that happen. But with COVID, um, I believe that, you know, it has um, enhanced our understanding of mental health issues to some degree. So positive emotions enhance resilience. So things like enjoyment, contentment, satisfaction, friendship and love enhance resilience and therefore the ability to cope. So, um, you know, we can also uh, look upon positive emotions, emotions as enhancing problem focused coping and reappraisal. So um, in other words, you know, we I'm not saying that we look for the problems but when we encounter a problem. The focus can be on uh, coping and reappraisal. Reappraisal in this context means, you know, OK, so what was my interpretation of it and how can I change that for the future in a more positive light? Positive emotions trigger an upward developmental spiral. So they help to build important physical, intellectual, social and psychological resources. Um, and positive emotions are associated with social activities, which in turn will increase positivity. So the broaden and uh, build theory, basically what I'm talking about here and what this theory um, proposes is that it can help individuals to consider positive emotions in order to help build a better life. So the emphasis on accumulation of psychological resources. So again, I've put that in red and I've put that in bold because I think that that underpins um, exactly what we're talking about here. So when I'm talking about resources, I'm talking about psychological resources, not so much the physical resources. Uh, of course, physical resources are important, but I'm focusing here on psychological resources. OK, so I've talked here about positive psychology and I've talked very, very, very briefly about what it is. Um, this is by no means um, all that it is. 
Um, it also involves um, optimism so and uh, versus um, pessimism. And optimism has been shown, so optimistic uh, optimism comes from the field of positive psychology as well, in which Martin Seligman and colleagues have done a lot of research. Um, and if I, if I look at that in the field of, of health, so optimism has been shown, um, you know, to have people who are more optimistic, have better social support, are more likely to uh, recover from their illnesses, more able to cope, um, as opposed to the negative and the pessimistic personality type. So now I'm going to talk about resilience. Resilience is probably something, of course, which we all read about. We all know what resilience is, but what does it mean and how can it help us? Uh, well, uh, resilience is the process and outcome of successfully adapting to difficult or challenging life experiences, especially through mental, emotional and behavioural flexibility and adjustment to external and internal factors. So that definition comes from the American Psychological Association, the APA. So it's a process. So what, what, what it's saying there is, if we break it down, um, it's again, and it goes in line with what Martin Seligman has, has stated about positive psychology and the PERMA model, is the uh, uh, ability to adapt to difficult uh, situations, which may be uh, anything. And of course, we have to understand as well that difficult situations or challenging life experience, you know, are going to differ from one person to another. And it's quite subjective. Uh, but um, if we can uh, try and build that resilience, uh, then it's going to be better able to help us cope with uh, things which uh, come our way. So in other words, the ability to bounce back, you know, in, in whatever situation we have experienced. And again, I, I don't want to uh, downplay, you know, tragic uh, uh, experiences and trauma. Um, I'm not doing that, but um, resilience, as, as posited by the APA, is this process really of being able to bounce back successfully? So what is, what are the factors in resilience? Okay, so these are some of the factors. Having the capacity to make realistic plans. So making realistic plans, of course, um, are, pla are plans which are within the realm uh, of our capabilities, being able to carry out those plans, being able to effectively manage one's feelings and impulses in a healthy manner, which can, of course, sometimes be quite difficult, uh, but we have to be able to do that if we are to remain resilient. Having good communication skills. Communication skills, of course, are the bedrock of communication, especially if we are working with others in the field of medicine, for example, um, in the field of education. And by the way, uh, positive uh, psychology has been used in, in education. There's a whole book about it and a whole study which has been carried out in Australia by Martin Seligman and colleagues, in which he's looked, he's applied the principles of positive psychology to education, so there might be something there that we can we can do with this. Having confidence in one's strengths and abilities, and having good problem solving skills. Now, all these sound very well um, and may not be easy for all of us to do because we have to remember as well that many of these things, um, you know, are based on personality type and certain uh, situations. But nonetheless, um, we can certainly. Um, using this model of resilience, uh, uh, try to do that. And I believe this is something that we can do for our students. And I'm going to talk about that at the end. Um, so we're talking about deconstruction of a specific problem by understanding how the beliefs, how somebody's belief about a specific problem calls them to feel a certain way in the first place. So not the event itself. So deconstruction means, of course, to pick something apart, to evaluate, and to evaluate in both positive and negative ways. But 
more on the positive side. So if we look at Martin Seligman's model of A, B, D, C, E. So there is a model. So uh, in the field of psychology and social science, we like to have these models. I prefer to call them frameworks, but they call them models. They are frameworks in which to help us to understand certain situations or events. So let's say, you know, somebody has an experience, a situation. There's an adverse situation that has happened to somebody. Uh, this is where somebody um, might look at the situation uh, which calls for a response. But what kind of response is that going to be? Is it going to be positive or negative? And the thing about beliefs, the B part of the model, beliefs, individual interpretation of an event. So an individual's interpretation of event, of course, as I've just said uh, just now, uh, can be subjective. Everyone's individual interpretation is going to be different. After all, that's why it's called individual, idiosyncratic to that person. And the consequences, the C part of, of the model, you know, the way we behave in response to a given situation. Are we going to be positive? Are we going to be negative? Are we going to be emotional? How are we going to handle it? And disputation, disputing the evidence. So in other words, you know, if we're rather upset about a situation, um, let's look at the evidence for it. You know, was it really something to be concerned about? What is the evidence for it? Energization. How did disputing or disputing this evidence change your mood? So actually, this also is aligned with uh, CBT. If we think about it, those that amongst us who would know about cognitive behavior therapy from the late Aaron Beck would see some parallels here. Cognitive behavior therapy, where cognitions of uh, cognitive causes our cognitions, the way we feel, the way we think, and behavior is derived from those uh, cognitions. And of course, therapy is the therapeutic process which involves uh, the ABDC model as well. So building resilience, evaluating circumstances which occur using these kinds of, uh, you know, using this model, using this acronym, this adversity, beliefs, consequences, disputation and energization. So these steps can help to build resilience by recognizing unfavorable thought patterns and finding the true reason behind the emotions, recognizing the negative impact of these emotions and learning to challenge them. So if we go back to the previous slide, we can see how that might apply, you know, disputing the evidence. This is what we use in CBT, you know, what evidence do you have um, for thinking about something in that way? Evidence, of course, we might think about um, when we talk about evidence, we might not apply that. We, we may not think that applies in the field of social science, but it does. We use this word quite a lot. What is the evidence for it? And then thereby challenging that evidence and thinking, OK, let's look at it from a different perspective. What is the other perspective, the other side of it? Um, and many times if we think about things are not really as serious as we might imagine. So to go back to that slide, these steps that I've mentioned um, can help resilience by recognizing. So learning to recognize and finding the true reason can uh, truly help us. Now the resilience skill set, self-awareness. Self-awareness of course is self-awareness, being aware of the self, being aware of our interpersonal, and our intrapersonal skills, which are very important skills in the field of communication, but also uh, at a general level, but also at a professional level, when we are in education, when we are in medicine, when we are in other fields uh, that which involve dealing with other people. Self-regulation, regulating one's emotions, being able to control uh, one's emotions by self-regulation. Mental agility, being able to think very carefully about what's going on and looking at the strengths of one's character, because everybody has strengths. 
everyone has strengths, everyone has weaknesses. So we need to draw on the strengths rather than the weaknesses. And connection, connection is connecting with others, social support, which has been well documented uh, in the literature um, to help people uh, cope with mental illness, cope with illnesses, cope with everything. And optimism, which I mentioned earlier, optimism, which comes from uh, Martin Seligman's positive psychology, uh, which he did a lot of research on optimism versus pessimism, uh, pessimistic type personalities. Now, um, I want to go to the what is known as the full pen resilience program. The pen resilience program uh, was a program put together by Martin Seligman and colleagues um, in the Penn State University, um, where these um, facets have been applied um, in many, many programs internationally, and they are 21 empirically validated skills that build, char that build uh, characters, cognitive, emotional fitness, strength of character, strong relationships. And the skills included in each program vary based on the needs of the client and length of the program. Um, and each skill will target one or more of those competencies, which I mentioned earlier. So this has been used, this Penn Resilience Programme has been used in practice worldwide and as I said was designed by Seligman and colleagues in 1999 um, and this, this is a training programme and it's a plan which is based on cognitive behavioural theory uh, which I mentioned just now, cognitive behaviour therapy from the late Aaron Beck, uh, Judith Beck, uh, Aaron Beck's daughter is now uh, running, uh, continuing the tradition of CBT um, and continues to practice and carry out research uh, in America. Um, this is a worldwide, uh, well-respected therapy that's used for depression, anxiety, and so on. Um, and, you know, this program has been used in schools as well, and it focuses on improving students' cognitive behaviour and skills, cognitions. Now this uh, program, uh, this resilience program, so now I've talked about, okay, I've talked about positive psychology, I've talked about what it is, very basically, very, very basic um, introduction to it. I've talked about uh, resilience and what it is, and now I'm talking about the implication or what this kind of program might mean for medical students, uh, because there have been quite a lot of studies carried out with medical students. Now, I'm not saying it's only for medical students, but because we are in the medical field, um, I would thought I would use this um, as an example. Um, and it, as I say, it could be something that could be easily applied. Uh, the Pen Resilience Programme, um, explored the positive and negative emotions, emotional regulation style, and resilience amongst Chinese medical students. And they use questionnaires. So questionnaires are used to assess resilience, positive and negative emotions, and emotional regulation styles. And this program, this training demonstrated that resilience could be learned and trained People can be trained uh, in resilience and they can learn resilience. And by doing so, it can improve emotional management, communication skills, interpersonal relationships, optimistic thinking and self-efficacy of students, which was found to be crucial to the enhancement of their resilience. So what I'm, I'm saying here is, uh, involved, included in all of this um, previous points that I made. Uh, these, I believe, um, from my experience of teaching medical students, and of course, in, in recent times, you know, we've seen, you know, that there is a, a problem for students. Again, I'm talking about medical students, but I'm not just limiting this to medical students only, but I'm, a, I'm thinking about it in 
in um, in line with medical students, knowing that you know uh, they can encounter a lot of problems, both in their studies and in housemen. And I'm thinking that you know this could really help students. And it's been shown. This is only one study. This is not a whole load of studies. I mean, loads of other studies which have been done, but I'm only just talking about one. Um, and I think that you know if we think about um, some of these facets, uh, we can see, you know, how um, this can be applied in the real world, and it has been applied, um, and that's been shown to be uh, successful in in helping. So um, this is a sort of quite a short uh, presentation, really, um, not really doing it a great deal of justice because it's a big field. Uh, but I would just like to say, uh, in conclusion, I've given a brief overview of this field of positive psychology, the PERMA model and resilience. Um, and I feel that resilience can be used to foster good mental health, not only in medical students, but in the general population, not just only um, students, generally. Um, and that by building resilience, um, and fostering better mental health. I'm not saying it's going to solve the problems of depression, anxiety, and so on, but I certainly believe that, you know, it, can, it could be used as a protective factor, and it has been shown uh, to be used as a good protective factor. So uh, this is about all that I have to say. I put the link there about this resilience program um, and the resilient skill set and other references um that you might find useful uh, and i would like to say thank you once again for your attention i really appreciate it and this is my email so if anybody has any questions uh after thought questions uh, please feel free to email me and i'll be happy to um, address your your questions so thank you very much Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Sharon, for your wonderful presentation. And uh, you have given us tips of how uh, we can better manage our stress and <laughs> when we choose to be resilient. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So better well-being. Okay. We will. Um, I, I request the audience to post your questions in the comment box. Okay. Many. I think we had one. Okay, Pro Prof. Razif Ali. Okay, he has given, he has left a comment. He says, "Wonderful positivity theme in your presentation." Thank you very much, Prof. Razif. <laughs> Dr. Sharon, I wonder if the students sit with student counselors, then later mm. with supporting friends to familiarize with coping stress, coping strategies. Is that that is a, a comment from Prof. Razi? No, he's Bobby. asking. I think it's a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think yes. I mean that that's what I'm saying. I'm I'm talking mm -hmm. here. Yes, absolutely. I'm talking here about social support. I mentioned social support and how yes, it's very important that we all have. I mean, not just only students, everybody. But we all have somebody that we can talk to and turn to in times of trouble. I mean, yes, of course, uh, professional help should always be sought where there is a, a, a problem, of, of course. But I would like to say, you know, that the social support can be an adjunct to professional help. Um, it, it, it is. I mean, there's no doubt that it is. Um, and it's very important. So the answer uh, is a yes, Prof Razif. I, I believe so. I believe so. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So much. Thank you for that. Okay. Thank you for that question. And uh, yeah, that. I think the Dato Razak has just thanked you uh, for a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for a nice lecture on resilience. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dato Razak. Thank you for that. Yeah. So, Madam Sharon, do you have anything to add on? or? Um, no, I, I would just like to say, as I say, I'm going to go back to the beginning. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Um, to this uh, presentation and taking time to give me the opportunity um, to do that. I think it's a very timely, this is why I chose this resilience thing, because I think it's very timely, um, you know, with the, the problems that um, people have, you know, within, with uh, 
after having you know the COVID pandemic, after all, we're still going through that. Mm. But thankfully, now we're coming through that the other side. Um, so I, I just wanted to say to put this in because I think it's timely. You know, the, our medical students, you know, reports in the news and so on about what's happening. Um, med some medical students, people get distressed, they get very uh, stressed and be feeling that they can't cope and so on. So I feel that uh, this is something that's very timely and very interesting um, to help them. So anybody listening, I hope that this has given some insight um, as to how we might build resilience and have a better mental health. So I'm talking here about preventative. As I said earlier, you know, depression, anxiety will always be there and so on. Uh, but, you know, if we can try and build resilience as a form of protective factor, then hopefully, you know, um, the outcome will be better for that person. Yeah. So thank you very much for your time. So, yeah, Ms. Sharon, so you mean to say like building, uh, you're creating trust um, in their own abilities, you know, even with our own students, right? I suppose it, it yes. Yeah. I mean, you say building trust. Uh, build, uh, building trust was not the phrase that I used, but actually, uh, thank you, Dr. Deeper, in a way. I, I guess it is building trust. Trusting in oneself, isn't it? Believing in oneself that that that, that you can do something, that you can achieve what you want. Um, I believe so. I, I believe that we can actually build in trust. I think that's a, a good way to put it, actually. Um, yes. So thank you for that. Yes, I believe so. So with I, the, I mean, any person who has a high level of uh, um, uh, perceived um, um, self-efficacy they trust yes. their own abilities right yeah yes but of and course uh, not everybody is like that uh, you <laughs> see that's the thing not everybody has a high self-efficacy so <laughs> those with low self-efficacy can also <laughs> build um, <laughs> resilience it's, exactly. it's not limited to um, just only some people it can <laughs> be uh, uh, built um, of course, you know, uh, personality types are important as well. It's not mm. just as simple as that. Um, but I believe, you know, that it can, people try, it can help. Even if only a little bit, it, it's something. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Sharon, for your time. And uh, yeah, th thank you so much for that uh, nice uh, uh, presentation about resilience and how it's related with mental health. Yeah. Thanks a lot, and I hope to have another talk uh, in, in yeah, the upcoming okay. CME events. Yeah, okay, okay sure, yeah, for okay. sure, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you so much. much, thank you, thank you. And I would like to thank all of you for joining us, and um, hope to see you all in the next CME event. Uh, until then, take care, all of you. Thank you, thanks a lot.